Welcome back to the leading edge of integrative mental health. I'm your host, Lisa Dale Miller. You can subscribe and stream The Groundless Ground on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, TuneIn, and YouTube. And of course, find out more at groundlessground.com. It's been a little over a year since I posted the last episode of the Groundless Ground podcast. In some ways, I feel like I should apologize given for five years, I know many listeners came to expect a new episode, if not every month, every other month. And I went on hiatus without any notice to all of you. So it's been a year, a year of radical change impacting every aspect of my professional and personal life. Because the year was so full, something had to give, and the Groundless Ground podcast was that thing that I had to put down for a while. The radical change in my life was all self-motivated, self-instigated, and self-accomplished, and it feels really good. It's one thing to preach the gospel of change is good, encouraging fearlessness and openness, particularly when you're a psychotherapist and you have a patient who's facing a really devastating change or a death or some kind of necessary relocation. There's all kinds of events in a human life that precipitate radical change. It's another thing to decide on your own. It's time for me to completely upend my whole life. And that's walking a walk that I knew I could do. And I'm glad that I did it. I'm no longer in Silicon Valley. That's lovely. And it's also strange. I knew I lived in a bubble for almost 29 years, but you really don't understand what a bubble Silicon Valley is until you finally move out. Well, I decided to move to another state. I've not retired. I've relocated. And these days, relocation can mean patient relationships may continue. Just about this time last year, once the move was a fait accompli, it really was up to me how to figure out how to share the news and then accomplish a successful transition Because the commute by plane was relatively easy from where I live now to Silicon Valley, I decided to alternate one week in my San Jose office and one week on telehealth. I had no idea how long that would last. And I decided to be really honest with my patients about that. I trusted together we would co-create a seamless transition to only telehealth sessions. And I knew Some patients would end their work with me because that might not be right for them. I just sensed that knowing when to pull the trigger on no longer flying down would be apparent to all of us. And about six months in, one by one, my patients on their own began to express the following. You know, Lisa, it's really nice to see you in person, but at this point, it doesn't seem that much different. The ease with which it just started to show up and then the unity and collectiveness of it really surprised me. And I think I felt relieved. I had managed to gain my patients' assent to stop commuting while building deeper trust and connectedness. Seven months after I moved to a new state, I closed my San Jose office. It was a profoundly touching experience for me for lots of reasons. And maybe at some point I'll offer some insights about that. But right now, I just wanted a chance to reconnect with all of you and give you a sense of how come there's been no Groundless Ground podcast for a year. Well, now you know. So the episode you're about to hear is a Dharma talk I gave at Marin Sangha four weeks ago. This talk is meant as an antidote to a world seemingly crumbling under the weight of hatred, greed, and apparently ubiquitous ignorance. So may this talk in some small way lessen any feelings any of you might have 
of helplessness, powerlessness, and despair. So I'm going to begin with a quote from one of the most renowned Tibetan Buddhist masters from the 14th century, Longchen Rajam, otherwise known as Longchenpa. There is born in you exceeding compassion for all those living creatures who have forgotten their true nature. So this is what my talk is about tonight. As many of you might know, in the Pali Canon, the Buddha himself rarely uttered the word bodhisattva to refer to himself or, frankly, to any other being. However, Theravada Buddhist history shows that many Theravadins vowed to become bodhisattvas and also undertook the practice of what's known as the paramitas, the ten perfections. The ten perfections are still taught in the Buddhist tradition, although it's not certainly something taught as much as mindfulness or compassion, although those two things are actually included as two of the ten perfections. So I'll just go through the list in case anyone doesn't know what the ten perfections are. So they're generosity, morality, renunciation, insight, zeal, patience, truthfulness, resolution, loving kindness, and equanimity. And maybe some of you recognize some of these things from, for instance, the four Brahma Viharas. One of our most renowned Theravada modern day teachers, Bhikkhu Bodhi, says that according to all Buddhist traditions, to attain the supreme enlightenment of a Buddha, requires the forming of a deliberate resolution and the fulfillment of the 10 spiritual perfections or paramitas. And it is a bodhisattva who consummates the practice of these perfections. He says it's perplexing that no teachings about a bodhisattva path or bodhisattva practices are actually included in the discourses regarded as coming down directly from the earliest periods of Buddhist literary history. And he says, this remains a puzzle. <laughs> Be that as it may, of course, in the Mahayana and Vajrayana Buddhist traditions, those practitioners are very familiar with Shantideva's seminal text, The Way of the Bodhisattva, which teaches the cultivation of something called bodhicitta, Many of you may have heard of bodhicitta, and I am going to be discussing bodhicitta tonight. Bodhicitta is the ultimate aim of all bodhisattvic and Buddhist practices. And frankly, I encourage any of you to read The Way of the Bodhisattva, because Shantideva really has a take-no-prisoners attitude to practicing the Dharma. Vigilance is primary in all of his teachings. So... What is bodhicitta? Bodhi means awake or enlightened essence. And citta means mind, heart. In Buddhism, there's no separation between mind and heart. So bodhicitta is a profound dedication to maintaining clear cognizance of the way things truly are internally and externally. And how are things? All phenomena are interdependently co-arisen and therefore empty of any separate self-existence. An awakened mind-heart which recognizes that truth is vast as space, utterly gone beyond any dualistic notions of me and you, us and them, inside and outside. That Buddha mind is pure awareness an empty cognizance, luminously and ceaselessly manifesting effortlessly as limitless, compassionate responsiveness. I'm actually going to say that again. That Buddha mind is empty cognizance, luminously and ceaselessly manifesting effortlessly as limitless, compassionate responsiveness. So taking that as their aim, a bodhisattva is one who lives humbly in the world, 
tirelessly seeking to awaken all beings to their Buddha nature. And all beings have Buddha nature, by the way. You don't need to do anything to get Buddha nature. You already have it. Bodhisattvas fearlessly recognize all forms of ignorance, greed, and hatred, and they seek to transform those forms into prajna paramita, which is the perfection of wisdom. So we're really going to talk about the perfection of wisdom tonight. And from this point of view, every moment of a bodhisattva's life is an invitation to take on the responsibility of decreasing the mass of human suffering by seeding the world with at least one more quiescent, wise, and compassionate person who moves throughout their life without harm, awakened, and selfless. So bodhicitta has two levels, absolute bodhicitta and relative bodhicitta. Absolute bodhicitta is the awakened mind heart, liberated from all dualistic perception. Dzogchen Kempo Choga Rinpoche says, generating bodhicitta means making your mind vast and fearless. In general, our minds are limited and restricted by ego clinging, but the mind itself is as vast as space. From within that timeless awareness, a bodhisattva contemplates the infinite number of sentient beings suffering and wanting relief. A bodhisattva contemplates the infinite qualities of Buddhahood, which they want all sentient beings to attain. And through these contemplations, the precious bodhicitta becomes a supremely effective antidote to ego clinging. I would add to that also an effective antidote to dualistic perception, that me, you, us, them. Now, relative bodhicitta is the path to realizing absolute bodhicitta. Pema Chodron, one of our most beloved modern-day Buddhist teachers, says, The Buddha taught we are never separated from enlightenment. Even when most stuck, we are never alienated from the awakened state. This is a revolutionary assertion. Even ordinary people like us, with hang-ups and confusion, have the awakened mind of bodhicitta. The openness and warmth of bodhicitta is in fact our true nature. Bodhicitta, like the open sky, is always here, undiminished by the clouds that temporarily cover it. In the midst of our suffering, bodhicitta is always available. So you can see the necessary conditions for being a bodhisattva are there in every single human being. It's just the bodhisattva takes as their aim awakening all beings to the Buddha nature that all beings possess. That's really the only difference between any ordinary being and a bodhisattva. So the path of relative bodhicitta has two aspects, aspiration bodhicitta and application bodhicitta. You can say these things, but you have to have a way to obtain and attain these kinds of aspirations as well as the direct experience of bodhicitta. So aspiring to awaken for the benefit of all beings means keeping that goal at the forefront of our thoughts and actions, no matter what causes and conditions we may encounter. Aspiration bodhicitta inspires us to be wise and compassionate, even when it may feel hard to do. That's another difference between ordinary beings and someone who has committed themselves to bodhicitta and the cultivation of bodhicitta on the bodhisattvic path. Even when it feels hard to do, there's that aspiration to act from the awakened mind heart even if in a particular moment, even a bodhisattva is not necessarily experiencing the awakened mind heart. Still, the recognition of it is there and the aspiration to embody it is there. So aspiration bodhicitta is a necessary precondition for application bodhicitta, the means by which 
we carry out our efforts to awaken all beings. The more we practice on the cushion and in daily life, the more absolute bodhicitta, immeasurable compassion, and unbounded wisdom blossom from within and without. Another great Buddhist teacher, Alan Wallace, reminds us that when bodhicitta arises spontaneously and effortlessly, suffusing one's entire lifestyle, then even if you haven't committed to being bodhisattva, you actually are a bodhisattva. So to inspire all of us in this desire to cultivate bodhicitta, I've brought with me a section of one of Longchenpa's renowned texts, called Relaxing into the Nature of Mind. And this is part of a set of texts that have recently been translated by a group of incredibly scholarly translators. Antepa wrote so much in his long life, so little of it has been translated. More and more of it is coming out. So I have been reading these three texts. It's hard to imagine that this was written in the 14th century because it feels so modern. I am going to invite all of you to sit back and relax as you hear Longchenpa's profound understanding of mind, self, and world as they actually are. So the title of this text is called Finding Rest in the Nature of Mind. And this is just a section from this larger text. Now all phenomenal existence is from the outset without self and beyond conceptual construction. Nonetheless, humans live life ignorantly clinging to phenomena as real. Joys and sorrows do indeed occur, yet in the very moment of their arising, Phenomenal experiences are dreamlike. Though all things appearing outwardly occur within the mind, they are not the mind itself, but neither are they something other than the mind. Though humans are habituated to perceiving an apprehender and an apprehended, that dualistic constructed reality is like a face and the reflection of a face in a mirror. Although a face appears on the surface of the mirror, an actual face is not really there. And yet, no other thing has cast its form upon the glass. While not being there, its likeness appears and is perceived as something different from the mirror. Know that all phenomenal experiences are exactly like this. If left unexamined, experience is quite convincing. But when experiences are investigated, they become elusive. When thoroughly examined, they transcend all speech, all thought, all formulation. Whether viewed as existing or not existing, phenomena are just illusory appearances, continually arising, existing, and ceasing. From the very instant they occur, Appearances have no intrinsic, separate beingness. They are like the water of a mirage or the moon reflected in a pool. Knowing that means you come to clear conviction of the empty nature of samsara and its karmic perceptual habits. And you know with certainty that what is empty does appear. You understand the non-duality of appearance 
and emptiness. By dispelling both extremes, existing and not existing, and striving for the middle path, you come to freedom in the sky-like state, abiding neither in existence nor in non-existence. This is ultimate reality, sublime and essential. Though mind seems to exist, when searched for, it cannot be found. When looked for, it cannot be seen. It has no color, no shape. Mind is not outside or inside. The past mind cannot be observed. The mind yet to be born is nowhere to be found. The present mind does not remain. Groundless, rootless, mind is not a thing. There is no point into it. Do not let your mind search for a mind. Just let mind be as it is. Because the object sought perversely is the subject seeking. In searching for itself, there's never any finding. Primordially unborn and uncontrived, mind does not dwell, it does not cease. Mind is featureless, empty lucidity, appearing unceasingly. Therefore, mind is not a nihilistic emptiness. There is no describing it. It does not exist as this or that because in no way can it be identified. Its nature should be understood as primordially pure. The primordial essence of mind is beyond good and bad, beyond hope and fear. So pair away all your assumptions. Within awareness, all causes and conditions naturally subside as soon as they appear, like ripples on the water. When I watch thoughts as they arise, the water vanishes. I search for it, but nowhere is it found. Neither is the searcher seen. There's just freedom from conceptual elaboration. There's no agent, there's no object of its action. I have come to the primordial state, which is like space, immaculate. There is no going back, and where might I now go? I have reached the place of exhaustion of phenomena. Knowing this, I want for nothing else. Whoever comes to freedom has, like me, cut through delusion. There is no goal, no clinging. Instead, there is an all-embracing evenness, openness, relaxedness, equality. So I invite you to just take a moment Allow this deep and incredible wisdom to suffuse you fully. Never forget that every one of you and all other human beings, no matter how lost in suffering they may be, are nothing more than this primordially pure, boundlessly compassionate, wakeful cognizance. That is the recognition that allows a bodhisattva to walk in the world fearlessly. And Shantideva describes it this way. He says, just as I would take great pains and be careful about a wound, 
when standing in the midst of an unstable, wild crowd, so too I shall safeguard always the wound of my mind. Since I'm living in the midst of difficult people. Between this advice and the wisdom that Longchenpa has just offered to us, hopefully you have a better sense of how a bodhisattva can live in the world with the clear, sure recognition of the mass of human suffering and still understand from right view, from wise seeing, the empty, luminous nature that all that suffering actually is. Every single being who is causing suffering in this world actually has at their essence this primordially pure, empty, luminous compassion. And so they can be tireless because they understand the nature of the way things actually are. And they don't waste time in delusion, in self-clinging, in distorted notions of the way things are. I know lots of Buddhist teachers talk about bodhicitta, they talk about being a bodhisattva, they talk about compassion and wanting to heal all beings and it just all seems so ridiculous unless you have the capacity to understand the nature of the way things are from the perspective of, for instance, how Longchenpa has put it forth, going beyond dualistic perception, going beyond us and them, and not from the perspective of some concept, from the perspective of recognizing the way things actually are, from an awakened mind heart, from bodhicitta. In conclusion, because I'm sure you guys have things to say and questions I can't wait to hear, Sometimes it's good to have some shorthand, and the Buddha was really good at shorthand, even though it's just a small part that I read to you out of Longchenpa's text. He's very pithy, and he's good at shorthand. This whole idea of seeing things the way they are, especially in a tough moment, can be boiled down to three things we have to remember. The fundamental purpose of human life is to end suffering by recognizing the dependently originated apparency of all internal and external phenomena, otherwise known as not-self in the Buddhist tradition. Two, all human minds are negatively influenced by primordial ignorance and volitional dispositions. None of us get a pass at it, trust me, unless some of you are Buddhas, which could be. I certainly am negatively influenced by primordial ignorance and volitional dispositions quite a bit. Therefore, it is important to remember every human being is the owner and heir of their perceptions, thoughts, emotions, and actions. Three, due to the immeasurable luminosity of awareness, every moment of human existence is endowed with potential for full liberation from afflicted perception. And that can be full liberation you have about a very specific afflictive perception and you just get it and it's gone. And you don't suffer from it anymore. You know, it doesn't always have to be full-blown Buddhahood. It really can be moment-to-moment liberation. Moment-to-moment liberation is sometimes even more powerful because you add up those moments and loosening, fixation. At some point, your mind is going to be clearer and freer and you're going to be living a life that is much more fearless and less driven by hope and fear. And that, of course, is my wish for all of you especially in these times when 
it really is incumbent upon Buddhist practitioners like us to be the light in a world of darkness. No matter how dark the world gets, we have the capacity to continue to be shining bright lights in this world. I'm happy to open this up. Thank you. I have never heard aspiration bodhicitta yes. leads to application bodhicitta. I think that's my new mantra. Remember in the beginning of the talk, there was a point where Kempo actually said, bodhicitta is the antidote to ego clinging. Why? Because recognizing the empty luminosity of all phenomena, which means there is no separation, obliterates the entire idea of a separate self. So bodhisattvas are average people living humbly in the world. You never know who a bodhisattva is, frankly, because they live humbly in the world. And that means they are imperfect humans. And so everyone is going to have these moments where our karmic perception and the afflictive emotions that every one of us has will show up. What matters is how fast do we recollect? There is no perfect bodhisattva. I mean, there's levels of awakening, but there's no perfection. And even, even the Buddha, you know, parinirvana is a thing. There's no perfect enlightenment until you drop the body, apparently. I'm so grateful to our teachers. We are very fortunate. Thanks for listening to today's show. To get in touch, please visit groundlessground.com. Let's dedicate our efforts to the healing of our planet and all its inhabitants. See you next time on the Groundless Ground.